Wonderful. So my name is Shakela Alvarenga. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program, A Daunting Array of Threats, How the FBI is Fighting Crime in Las Vegas. In April, Spencer Evans was named special agent in charge of the FBI's Las Vegas field office. His career began in 2004 when he joined the FBI as a special agent investigating white collar crime and healthcare fraud. He currently oversees tactical field operations, case administration, and the supervision and management of the criminal investigative unit at the FBI's Las Vegas field office. Please welcome Mr. Evans. So let's talk about your career path thus far. This is you know, a pretty rare opportunity for the public to get a chance to sit down, you know, to speak with you and to answer some questions that, that they may have. So SAC Evans worked with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force in both California and Virginia. So let's just talk a little bit more about those uh, both assignments. Sure. So uh, before, I would be remiss, Shakila, if I didn't uh, thank the Bob Museum for the invitation to be here. This is a great venue to be uh, discussing FBI and law enforcement matters. For those that don't know, uh, the, the Mob Museum was the recipient of last year's Director's Community Leadership Award, which is a very prestigious award. We give one out per year on behalf of the FBI Director to an individual or organization that has made substantial contributions. Uh, to informing people about law enforcement, furthering dialogue, helping protect public safety, and last year's recipient was the Mob Museum. So I think that deserves a round of applause for sure. Thank you. Okay, o Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force stuff. So yes, when I was an agent in the San Diego field office, I was working kind of in the early stages of the opioid epidemic. Uh, uh, cases that involved individuals that were smuggling drugs uh, into the United States from Mexico and from other countries, and then also trafficking pharmaceuticals that had been diverted within the United States. And so it was interesting in subsequent years kind of seeing what, you know, what I think we were seeing at, at, at kind of the ground stages, what then took off later, it became kind of a nationwide, you know, epidemic. So we were doing everything from arresting, you know, doctors and pharmacists that were giving, you know, scripts for cash. That's something that we still, you know, in some pockets uh, see today to organizations of you know, gang members that realized, hey, it's more profitable and actually less risky to get out of kind of inner city neighborhoods where they were used to dealing you know, crack and then you know, meth and other you know, kind of hard drugs and go to the suburbs where they could be dealing opioids, Oxycontin and kind of other prescription narcotics um, to kind of you know, the rich kids in the suburbs, right? That, that had money and that were going to parties where people were taking these pills and these kids are thinking, hey, this is something a doctor prescribes to you, right? How bad can it be, right? These are kids that would never shoot a line of heroin, but would have no problem taking a pill because pills are what you take when you get sick. So, you know, what can the harm be? But in reality, these, you know, these opioids uh, were getting kids addicted. And then when they could no longer, you know, afford uh, the prescription, you know, uh, pills they couldn't steal, then they switched to heroin. And so now we've seen kind of a continuing evol ev evolution where now fentanyl is the, you know, is the biggest concern that we have, killing you know, thousands of people you know, every year throughout the United States. And this is a drug, it's a synthetic opioid that is 80 times more powerful than morphine. So very, very small amounts. You know, the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, has been heavily involved in this effort. They have a campaign called One Pill Can Kill, which is aptly named because we've had many, many sad, tragic cases of individuals that after taking one pill, uh, you know, overdose because it's just such a powerful, uh, powerful narcotic. Let's talk a little bit more about fentanyl because that's a subject that, um, you know, we here at the museum, and I know that many of you have, have come to some of our programs as well, have, have talked about fentanyl and how it, dangerous and heartbreaking it, it has ravaged so many communities across the, the nation. So what is the FBI doing to try to, to stop it? Yes, yeah, a good question. So th this is a, like many of the threats that we will likely talk about this evening, these are threats that we can't arrest our way out of. There, there's not enough FBI agents, there's not enough police officers, you know, in the valley to be able to, you know, just handle this issue if we are strictly going to deal with it on an enforcement side. Mm -hmm. And so these are really kind of whole of society, whole of community sorts of issues because they require everything from education 
you know, to parents having conversations, you know, parents and guardians having conversations with their kids, uh, you know, to awareness in the schools, public health has an important role in this. It, it really is a multifaceted, you know, sort of issue. So specifically on the FBI side, we obviously are really focused you know, on, on the enforcement end of things. So the intelligence of connecting the dots of how is it that the precursor chemicals are getting to Mexico? How is it that it's getting smuggled into the United States? Where is it being synthesized? What are the organizations that are being used to traffic it? Whether that's, you know, drug trafficking organizations, cartels, or then street gangs as it hits the streets in the United States. We're partnering with, you know, every three letter agency that you can imagine because we're all kind of on the same page of trying to address this issue both domestically and then increasingly with our offices uh, that are located uh, outside the United States as well. But beyond that, again, because we can't arrest our way out of these sort of, uh, these sort of issues, there's really been a lot of um, public awareness that we're trying to do on it, right? Everything from you know, billboards and you know, tweeting it to speaking to um, you know, principals and educators and you know, families and kids you know, in high schools or even middle schools to try to create more awareness about just how dangerous uh, this particular issue is uh, so that, you know, kids are better informed so that they, you know, see a pill that they don't recognize, they might think twice before taking it, which unfortunately is, is kind of something we see all too much. Right. I want to talk a little bit about online drug trafficking because it seems like this whole other world that a lot of people just aren't knowledgeable about. So what exact, how does it work and, and what does it look like today? Sure. So I cut my teeth as an early, as a new FBI agent, kind of in some of the first cases that we had dealing with online drug trafficking. And, it, you know, when, when I did this, it was individuals in forums that were, um, you know, advertising uh, different drugs for sale under code names, and the money was being transferred via PayPal or anonymous Western Union pickups, and people were using, you know, encrypted email. It, we were successful in many ways of dismantling some of those websites. We, you know, we had undercover operations where we were running our own undercover websites and identifying kind of who was selling drugs, um, you know, and, and where, and, and building out the networks. The game really changed with the advent of the dark web, mm -hmm. right? Which is the web that you can't readily access through your, you know, through your internet browser and through Google, because the the level of obfuscation, the, the ability for criminals to hide themselves. Um, you know, through their internet connection was, was a game changer. And then the advent of digital currency, when people started paying in Bitcoin, right? I mean, I remember being a new agent and f seeing some of the first cases of people that were saying, no, no, I, I'm not interested in cash or Western Union pickups. We're going to use virtual, you know, currency and something called Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. In fact, on, as a side, it's my biggest regret. I remember telling my wife, this, there might be something to this Bitcoin thing. Maybe I should invest <laughs> a few thousand dollars in it. And, and then I talked myself out of it. My kids say, Dad, that money that you were going to invest, how much would that be worth today? And I looked it up. I said, it would have been worth $70 million <laughs> if I would have hung on to it. So anyway. But, Perhaps you wouldn't be sitting here with per, me. Though. You know, I, I, I think I still would because I love my job. But, you know, that's right. So, but anyway, th those sort of game-changing, you know, um, uh, technologies really made it so much more difficult. And so yeah. there's now a whole enforcement, you know, aspect in the Department of Justice that's specifically, especially within the FBI, targeting dark net opioid distribution because it has cyber elements to it. It's got money laundering and then traditional drug trafficking kind of all wrapped into one. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, going through the the flow of your career, another area that you investigated um, that's, that's very interesting, especially you know, here at the museum, is cartel kidnapping. So between 2007 and 2010, the FBI responded to at least one cartel kidnapping a month. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, when I was an agent in San Diego, um, so I'm a Spanish speaker, and I um, tried out for and made it onto our crisis negotiation team. Every FBI field office has a crisis negotiation team. They often deploy with the SWAT team, um, you know, to, to help kind of minimize the risk and, and help try to get, you know, barricaded subjects out of, you know, buildings. But we also were fortunate in San Diego in that we supplemented the local police department sheriff's office. So I've been to, you know, barricaded subjects, suicidal subjects, jumpers on the bridge, lots and lots of reps. But one of the things that was kind of a niche uh, thing that I did in San Diego as a Spanish speaker was help to negotiate when U.S. citizens and, yeah, and U.S. persons were kidnapped by drug cartels and held, and held ransom. So as you point out, in those years, when I was a negotiator from like 2008, 2010, 11, or around those years, there were times we were dealing with one or two cartel kidnappings a month. And so what was happening is 
Drug cartels are very well-funded, sophisticated organizations, and they're really smart. They've got this you know, infrastructure in place that they can use for drug trafficking and smuggling and human trafficking, but they realize, hey, we can use the exact same thing to extort people for money. So what they would do is they would kidnap, these are U.S. citizens who would live right on the California side of the border in San Diego, Chula Vista area, but had business interests in Tijuana. So they were constantly crossing the border. They would own, for example, maybe I'm a business owner, I own five different hardware stores, or I own you know, grocery stores or whatever. Cartels would kidnap these folks, and we're not talking like a, you know, hey, a couple guys kidnap you. These are three SUVs blacked out, painted in Mexican Federal National Police logos with lights, tactical guys, you know, eight, you know, to a vehicle that get out with long guns and take you at gunpoint. Mm. So, I mean, there's no way you're going to stop that, right? They would kidnap, you know, these, these folks, and then they would, you know, basically call their loved ones and, and extort them for money. Um, and you could tell the hallmarks of a cartel kidnapping is they always asked for a million dollars. They were super patient. Um, they had negotiators on their side that were the ones that would handle all the telecommunications. They had surveillance teams. And so the family would get together as much money as they could. They would bring it across the border. Kidnappers would be on the phone with them and they would tell them drive over to the soccer stadium, you know, drive to the beach. They'd have them driving around for two hours. And what they're doing is making sure they're not being surveilled. Yeah. And then they would say, pull off to the side of the road, roll down the window, hold the bag with the money out, look away. Somebody on a motorcycle comes, zips up, takes the money. About two hours later, another phone call would come in. That's a great start. How much more money can you get? Mm. And these families would go through this for months at a time. I remember distinctly meeting with one couple whose 20-year-old son had been kidnapped, and they had just come from the pawn shop. They had sold their wedding rings. They had sold everything they had trying to get money together to pay the kidnappers so that their loved one would be released. And in about 80% of the cases, if the loved one that had been kidnapped had no involvement in drug trafficking, they were released because mm -hmm. it's bad business if nobody ever you know, comes back. But um, yeah, it, it was an epidemic at that time for sure. You, you know, you've mentioned how just well-funded and organized these cartels were. Was that surprising to you at that time? It was. Um, I remember one of the things that vividly stuck in my mind that surprised me is if, if the family wasn't paying the money fast enough or the cartel thought that they were stalling for time, they would say, do you need a reminder of your family member? And they would FedEx you know, a, a finger or a, you know, a digit that they had you know, cut off. And I remember we got one of these hostage victims back and we had him checked out you know, by doctors and everything. And I was surprised, you know, I'm imagining like it is in the movies, right? There's some butcher in some basement and he's got a meat cleaver. He said, oh no, I was taken to a doctor's office they gave me anesthetic, they surgically removed my finger, you know, sewed it up, you know, took care of it, gave me a, a, a dose of antibiotics and sent me on my way. It's a doctor on the cartel payroll. Yeah. That's how well-funded and well-organized they were. And so basically, yeah, they could be barbaric if they needed to, but if they didn't need to, why ratchet it up, right? We can do it a professional way. It's a business transaction for them. Were you ever able to make any arrest? Was there any significant impact? V very rare. FBI San Diego, I think one time had identified a cell that was operating in the Chula Vista area, you know, on the California side, and the SWAT team hit it, and we were able to get some folks in custody. But that was very, very rare. I mean, the, the, the Ariano Felix organization, some of these Mexican drug cartels operating, you know, just south of the border, were very smart, Like right? they, they knew exactly you know, what authorities we had and didn't have. And so, you know, they, they, they knew that if they crossed the line in the United States, that it was a whole different ball game. And so it's also difficult when you're dealing with, you know, with Mexico, because there were very good law enforcement officers that we worked with, but they also, you know, have an endemic of, of public corruption on their side. So trying to figure out, you know, who, which police units were vetted and could be trusted with information, and, you know, was, was often a challenge, but it was rare to make arrest. What we typically hoped for was to get the loved one back, you know, with as little damage done and, and as safely and as quickly as possible. Right. How has cartel kidnappings evolved over time? So what, what I think has happened is, you know, I dealt with, when I was working these issues, two types of, of kidnappings. Traditional cartel kidnapping, which is kind of the MO that I just described, and then what we would call an express kidnapping, which is an organization, not the cartel, that's conducting an unauthorized kidnapping, because if the cartel finds out that anybody else is doing the kidnapping, they, they have plaza bosses, right, who basically control an entire area. So you can imagine a cartel controlling like the Las Vegas metropolitan area. Nobody else is allowed to do any significant illegal activity without the cartel's permission. 
So a group of, you know, three or four guys comes in and they would moonlight and it's called an express kidnapping because they've only got about 48 hours before the gig's up and somebody figures out, hey, you're kidnapping and you're not allowed to kidnap. So you could always tell they would ask for far less money. They wanted it very quickly, right? And so there was just a different way. And so at least that gave us, you know, a sense of, all right, we're not dealing with the cartel because they're always going to ask for a million dollars. They're always going to have this very sophisticated structure. But there was that group um, that, that operated, uh, or individuals that would operate what we called ki uh, uh, express kidnappings. Today, it's now evolved, and what we you know, see more often than not, I think the cartels are back to traditional you know, human trafficking, dr you know, drug trafficking, and have you know, stopped a lot of the kidnapping. But now we see virtual kidnappings, which the lion's share of them, 99%, don't involve cartels at all. It's criminal organizations. And there actually is no kidnapping that's taken place whatsoever. It's just an individual who doesn't have access to their phone immediately and enterprising criminals that are calling family members in a panic, trying to get them to send money by telling them that their loved one has been kidnapped. Mm. So these are organizations, you know, not very sophisticated that are monitoring social media and can see, hey, this person's out of country. Right? And maybe they're at a bar and they take their cell phone and they're separated for, for a couple hours and they call grandma or the aunt or somebody else and say, we have your loved one and there's lots of screaming and it's high, high tension trying to get people to pay money very quickly when in reality, again, there is no kidnapping. The loved one's just been separated from their phone. Right. And that happens throughout the United States hundreds and hundreds of times. With virtual kidnappings, why are those cases more difficult to investigate and, and prosecute as well? Yeah, for a couple reasons. So one, uh, they're, taking, they're being conducted by transnational criminal enterprises that are located in Southeast Asia or West Africa or other places where we don't have as good a cooperation or the ability to kind of track back who they are. Um, a lot of them go underreported, right? So because they're not asking for a lot of money, uh, you know, someone that, you know, sends five, six hundred dollars uh, is probably embarrassed after the fact when they get a hold of, you know, their niece, nephew, son, daughter, and find out that they're not kidnapped, but they're less likely to report it to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, you know, the sheer volume makes it difficult to determine, you know, what groups are operating in common. A lot of these have actually been per uh, perpetrated by prisoners that are, you know, in a lockup somewhere, right? You're in state custody, and, you know, in some state, and you're using your phone time to extort people. Because the, at the end of the day, yes, we can ultimately track down and figure out who it is. Yeah. But if I'm doing a 20-year sentence, like, what do I care, right? I just got, you know, a few thousand dollars by performing this scam, and it's, you know, it, no skin off my nose. Wow. And so that, that's what makes it really challenging to work those. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about your work here in Las Vegas. So Las Vegas is, of course, an, an interesting city. Um, and, you know, it's different from some of the other areas, too, that you've, sure. you've worked in. So what are the division's main areas of focus? Yeah, so as you point out, um, Shaquille, Las Vegas is definitely an, an interesting area. So just by way of kind of reference, FBI Las Vegas, uh, the 56 field offices in the FBI, we're right about in the middle. I think we're number 30 or something in terms of size. So medium-sized field office. But then you think about what we have in our area of responsibility here. I think we have the seventh or eighth busiest airport in the United States. 50 million visitors, you know, any given year that come in. Mm -hmm. And so not only do we have our own subjects and our own cases, but increasingly, you know, we have everybody else's bad guys that come <laughs> here, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we have a very active, you know, fugitive team, for example, that, that is constantly going after people uh, who may not be subjects of FBI Las Vegas, but, have, you know, have come from other places. You know, I would say beyond that, one of the things, I, look, I've been in the organization for, you know, I'm going on 19 years now. You'd think I would stop being surprised. This is now my fifth field office that I've been in. But... I got the case briefings, you know, from kind of, you know, A to Z on all the different things we're working, and I was blown away by the level of work that we have. Counterterrorism, counterintelligence, cyber, transnational organized crime, violent crime, crimes against children, white collar. I mean, every program that the FBI has, we have a squad here in, in Nevada, in the, in the Vegas metro area, or in our satellite offices uh, in Reno and Elko, that's investigating, you know, those cases. And, you know, our work is, uh, you know, incredibly challenging, but, um, you know, is on par with anything I've seen in even bigger offices that I've been in. 
a subject that you just mentioned, counterterrorism. So there are now as many international terrorism cases as domestic terrorism cases. So what do you think has changed over the years? Most recently, you may have read that a local man was arrested last week, actually, for threatening to carry out a mass shooting at the fashion show mall. Yeah, so th there's a lot to unpack um, there, but let me, let's, let's put it this way. Let's frame the discussion a little bit. So the FBI works two types of terrorism investigations, generally speaking, international terrorism and domestic terrorism. There's a couple of key distinctions between the two. International terrorism, in many ways, is kind of easier to define. The State Department designates certain organizations as foreign terrorist organizations. So ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, the FARC in Colombia, right? These are examples of designated terrorist organizations. That makes it very easy when anybody espouses support for that organization or does anything to support them because there is a federal statute that makes it illegal to provide any sort of material support to a foreign terrorist organization. So there is no spe you know, First Amendment protection to say, I love ISIS and I want to go send them some money or buy them some warm socks for Christmas or you know, anything of the kind, right? Mm -hmm. Any sort of material support, whether it's providing you know, first aid, money, you know, anything, is against the law. On the domestic terrorism side, they share you know, some, some common themes in that they're also, domestic terrorists are also inspired by some sort of ideology, but the difference is, there is no list of domestic terrorist organizations as codified by federal law. And there are significant first and second and other amendment you know, protections for these individuals. So for example, the FBI doesn't investigate ideology. For us, a domestic terrorism case has to have three elements. There has to be some sort of federal crime involved. There has to be some sort of ideology that's, that's typically domestic in nature, change of, you know, in society or politics or government or something in some way. And then there has to be some sort of threat or act of violence. Until that kind of triangle, those three elements are met, we don't have a domestic terrorism case. And so sometimes people are confused because they're like, you know, hey, the KKK or, you know, these other groups, like, why are they all not under investigation? Mm. And it's because it's not against the law. In fact, it's protected you know, in the Constitution to espouse your support for whatever group, regardless of how despicable their actions may be, you don't cross the line until there's the, the potential of violence and a federal law that's potentially violated. That's when, you know, the free speech now becomes, you know, a potential legal issue that the FBI is looking into. And so, to, you know, to answer the question that you, I think you raised at the outset, what we're seeing today in the United States is, unfortunately, more and more individuals who feel that that, that it is natural and, a, and that they have no problem, you know, advocating for violence because they're unhappy with something happening, you know, within the United States, whether it's the government or whether it's on the abortion, you know, rights issue. We break terrorism, domestic terrorism into several different categories, but what they all have in common is we are investigating the violent extremist aspect of some sort of, you know, political or other grievance that has gone beyond free speech and is now advocating for committing a crime of violence. Mm. What do you tend to see locally when it comes to domestic terrorism? So the two, big, the two broadest categories for the FBI um, by far are what we call anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremism, uh, and then racially motivated violent extremism. So in, in both these cases, as the you know, name connotes and kind of describes, it's individuals whose political agenda, um, you know, or, or bent, so to speak, um, you know, uh, lean toward, and it, it happens on both sides of the issue, right? The other one that I would highlight, for example, is, um, you know, abortion-related violent extremism. We see that on both sides. In fact, I think the director recently testified before Congress, I believe something like 60 to 70 percent of the cases that we have right now in abortion-related violent extremism are against pro-life individuals. Whereas, you know, a lot of times I think people, and rightly so, associate the FBI with investigating violations of the FACE Act for people that want to bomb abo abortion clinics and those kind of things. But there's actually violent extremism on both sides of the issue. Right. So there's also been a significant increase in juveniles threatening to commit violent acts. They're younger and they're being radicalized online by some of these messaging apps like 4chan, which you may have heard of. So what is the FBI doing to try to tackle this issue as well? Yeah, this, this is one of the more challenging things we're facing in law enforcement writ large and specifically in the FBI these days. So as you point out, Shaquilla, that's exactly right. 
we are seeing increasingly across the spectrum, uh, and, and here in Nevada and certainly in Vegas as well, that individuals are self-radicalizing at a younger and younger age. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is a challenge is obviously multiple reasons, right? One, there's not nearly you know, the number of records or information or data points we have on these individuals, right? A 15, 16 year old that you know, is, is living at home, going to high school, they're unlikely to have as much of a criminal history, mm -hmm. they're not going to you know, own property or have credit history or the networks of the traditional ways that we've detected terrorist activity, they're off the radar because they're a kid, right, going to school. The, the other challenge we face is the federal system in particular is not set up to investigate and prosecute juveniles. Federal law and the procedures that we have just don't, uh, don't allow for it. They didn't envision these sort of issues. And so it's very difficult to bring federal charges against a 15 or 16 year old. States are also in many ways ill-equipped to be able to charge them because sometimes the crime that they're committing, if they were older, would be a federal crime but isn't a violation of state law. When I was in Florida a few years ago as a supervisor in Northwest Florida, we got a lead that said uh, it bounced through some servers and ultimately came back through Germany. Hey, somebody in an online gaming platform is threatening to blow up a particular high school and then as all the students leave, they're gonna shoot them up, right? And it was on a specific day and a specific time. Very kind of credible, specific sort of threat. We track back the internet traffic and identify where it came from and executed an emergency search warrant on that particular location. And we pulled out of the house a 15-year-old at gunpoint who thought it was fun while he got bored while playing online gaming to threaten to shoot up the school and see what the police response would be. Hmm. Here's the challenge, right? The school that he was threatening to blow and shoot up wasn't in Florida, it was in another state. And because he was a juvenile, no ability to prosecute him on the federal side, and he technically had not committed a violation of Florida state law. Right. So that kid was let go with a stern warning. I mean, what are you, what are you gonna do, right? So we sat down with the mom and was like, hey, you have an issue, but beyond kind of creating awareness of it, that's a perfect example of where we're not set up to do it. Now, luckily in this case, it was a hoax. The nightmare scenario is the one where, no, they're actually operationally planning to do something, mm -hmm. and we either can't detect it, or when we can, we just don't have the effective tools to be able to mitigate it. And so, again, this goes back to you know, the opioid issue we're talking about. These are whole of society whole of government sort of you know, problems where this requires education, uh, this requires outreach, this requires people saying something. You know, the, the one, I guess, silver lining in this is the FBI's Critical Incident Response Group, the Behavioral Analysis Unit, the, the Silence of the Lambs folks, so to speak, of, um, you know, of, of movie and TV fame, have done extensive studies looking at lots of active shooter and other sort of you know, events over the years, and what they've found is there's an average of like three to four discernible moments at time while that individual was on the pathway to radicalization or violence that people around them detected but didn't say something, mm -hmm. right? It's the spouse or the friend that's like, yeah, I knew something was off, but I kind of dismissed it or rationalized it. It's the teacher, it's the, you know, and sometimes it's law enforcement even that has an interaction that, you know, because we don't see the whole picture, dismissed it. And so that's really why it requires everybody coming together because there's not enough dots that any individual or group can connect themselves, certainly not on the FBI or law enforcement side. Right. Let's talk about international threats for a few minutes. What kind of international threats has the FBI um, Las Vegas field office investigated? Uh, all of them? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I don't mean to be tongue in cheek, but it, it's interesting. <laughs> Virtually every sort of violation we have these days, you know, can or does have an international nexus or has a cyber nexus. Right. Whereas that used to be more, much more of a niche sort of thing. Now it's, you know, almost kind of, you know, the status quo, right? And so, you know, whether it's, you know, cyber crime itself, whether it's counterintelligence, hostile nation states, terrorism, white collar crime, money laundering. I mean, if you run down the list of all the different things that we investigate, they all have you know, one of those two um, you know, nexuses. And, and, and I, what I would say is the FBI, you know, it, it's interesting, it's almost, it almost goes back to the roots of why the FBI was founded, right? You got in the early uh, you know, 1900s, crime being committed in one state and individuals then going to another state and this, the jurisdiction stopped, right? So the police couldn't you know, chase them from state to state. And so hence the, you know, the creation of the FBI and, and the need to kind of investigate these things you know, on a federal basis. 
Increasingly, that's the way it is today internationally. So the reason that we have FBI personnel in some 63 offices overseas embedded with U.S. Embassy personnel is to be able to follow the criminals, follow the money, follow the connections wherever they lead, because increasingly, as your question you know, kind of uh, speaks to, where this leading is overseas. Right. Now, another priority on the FBI's list is counterintelligence. So for those who don't know what it is, what is counterintelligence and what kind of cases do you investigate that are related to foreign and economic espionage? Yeah, great question, Shakela. So intelligence activities of a nation is when you're spying on another nation. The FBI has primary responsibility for counterintelligence in the United States, which means catching the spies. And so this, this runs the gamut and has really kind of changed significantly, even in the time that I've been in the FBI. So if you think about, you know, going back to what you may see in, in kind of movies or, or very much what the FBI experience was through the Cold War, all the way through the 90s, even the early 2000s, you, know, you would not be wrong if you picture, maybe it's a little overly dramatic, but the people in, you know, trench coats, hiding in dark alleys, meeting with their handlers, passing off state secrets that they've stolen from the government, right? And, and that, to a certain extent, still exists today, right? Where the FBI is catching spies from hostile nation states that are trying to steal the secrets of the United States. The game changer today is that what is being stolen is not just the hardened military secrets of, you know, the technology for the latest, greatest submarine or bomber or, you know, things like that, while that threat certainly still exists. But in addition to that, although exceeding it by orders of magnitude and volume, are people stealing economic and proprietary data, um, information that can be used to create proprietary you know, technology, intellectual property, right? It's economic espionage that's now the coin of the realm these days. Yeah. And the challenge there is it's being stolen from a whole segment of society that were not previously targets, and so to a certain extent are somewhat naive to what this threat looks like because it doesn't involve spies in trench coats embedded in the embassy. It involves folks that are already here who may be in an academic capacity or working for a company or you know, exploring a joint venture, and it's, it's like death by a thousand cuts. It happens mm -hmm. in so many different ways that are more subtle, that are more difficult to detect but it's nonetheless incredibly nefarious and is doing substantial damage to the economic and national security of the United States. Do you have an example? Sure, so here's a couple of them. So, um, and, you, and you'll understand, some of the very best ones uh, are ongoing now, so as much <laughs> as I would love to tell you, like hopefully you'll read about it you know, at, at some <laughs> point, but yeah. So I, I can only speak to kind of the adjudicated ones, but when I was in Oklahoma, for example, uh, I was the number two, I was the uh, assistant special agent in charge um, for the national security programs uh, in the FBI. We had an individual, uh, Chinese national, educated at a very prestigious university in the United States, who got a one-way plane ticket to China, and in his possession had a thumb drive that had the plans for a proprietary technology for a major Fortune 100 company that was worth $1 billion dollars. And he had a contract signed with an organization in China that was going to replicate that technology mm. and build their own business with it with the hopes of putting out of business the organization in the United States. Now, that's a successful example that we caught, right? Because we got him with, you know, with thumb drive. And it was basically detected because this person abruptly says, I'm resigning from the company, has a one-way plane ticket booked, and, and the, the dots weren't, you know, the things weren't adding up, and so we were able to intercede. But that sort of story is playing out day in and day out across mm -hmm. the United States. The FBI opens a counterintelligence investigation on the People's Republic of China every 12 hours in the United States. Wow. Every 12 hours, a new counterintelligence investigation is open specifically. And when I talk about China, just to be very, very clear, I'm not talking about the Chinese people. I am certainly not talking about Chinese Americans. I am talking about the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party that is running the country and has a 100-year plan to exert economic dominance over the United States by stealing their way to the top. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you.
Now, the third priority is also a topic that um, we have held several programs about. The FBI is the lead federal agency for investigating cyber attacks and intrusions, which is, of course, a complex and global concern. So briefly, if you can, what is the FBI's cyber strategy? The FBI's cyber strategy these days is to inflict consequences on those who would seek to do harm to the United States. And so it's interesting, when I came into the FBI, I remember thinking it was kind of strange, you know, the cyber squad handled anything, any crime that involved a computer, right? And nowadays when you think about that, that's really strange, that'd be like having like a fax machine squad, right? <laughs> we handle all crime that can be committed with a fax machine. I mean, increasingly, as we noted not too long ago, I mean, every crime involves a computer. So the specific niche that kind of cyber has these days is specifically on intrusions. Individuals that are gaining access, using malware, you know, using cyber tools for, for a crime that wouldn't otherwise be investigated elsewhere within the FBI. And so that really runs the gamut on a variety of levels of kind of what we see. There's everything from hostile nation states. So think Russia and China and North Korea and Iran that have active you know, cyber teams seeking to do harm to individuals and organizations in the United States. And then you've got individuals doing it for profit that are like in mom's basement and like, you know, super geek kind of, you know, folks, right, that are just trying to steal credit card information and then everything in between. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really interesting landscape and the FBI in many ways is perfectly positioned to play a significant role in cyber because of the dual nature of what we do. We are federal law enforcement but we also are a member of the US intelligence community. And so it gives us the ability to bridge that gap between pure intelligence collection, kind of you know, overseas sort of activities that you think about CIA and NSA, and also law enforcement of putting you know, bad guys in jail and putting cuffs on people. So the FBI, because we have authorities in both realms, we're really at that crossroads to be able to detect, identify, prevent cybercrime in a very unique and meaningful way. Yeah. For people out here in the audience and for those watching online, what can just everyday people do to protect themselves from cyber criminals? The, the thing that we preach the most is, is also kind of one of the simplest. It's what we call cyber hygiene. And so it, it, it may not come as a surprise, but I think some people would be surprised to learn when most of the crimes that we're investigating on, you know, on the cyber realm, Yes, there are the very sophisticated plots where someone used what's called a zero-day exploit, came up with this you know, amazing you know, tool, and that's how they you know, took advantage of the good guys and got into their systems. But that's the exception. The vast majority of the cases, the way that the person or that the threat actor or the group got access in the first place is because somebody's password was weak, right? Because they didn't use two multi-factor um, authentication, right? They just had a single password as opposed to getting the text message or the app that makes you verify, you know, that that is your password. Um, it's sharing too much information online so they're able to socially engineer and figure out, you know, how to get, how to convince somebody to fall for something. And so it's really not sophisticated. It's, it's finding the weakest link in the chain. And so we've had really complex you know, sophisticated uh, uh, security, you know, um, apparatus in, in a particular organization. And the bad guys are smart. They didn't go in through the front door with a very, you know, um, very complicated set of locks. They just found like the executive assistant or the secretary who had a weak password got into her system or his system and then used that to piggyback and, you know, jump from there. Mm. And so it really comes down to kind of, you know, uh, again, the basics like password protection, multi, you know, factor authentication, being smart about anytime you're parting with your personally identifiable information and it's somebody that you don't know or a link that's been sent to you, that extra pause and kind of thinking through what you're doing and independently doing some due diligence really is the best way to prevent the average Nevadan from becoming a victim of a cyber scam. Yeah. So you've been in the FBI for the past 18 years now. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in crime since when you first started? And what must the FBI do to kind of meet those challenges of today's crime? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think we've touched on some of the ones as, as we've been talking this evening. Clearly, cyber and its prevalence and kind of the ubiquitous nature of how everything that we touch 
uh, you know, has some sort of, you know, a, a, a computer or, you know, IT element these days is, is a big game changer. The other thing that I would say is, somewhat related to that, it's the sheer volume of data that we're dealing with yeah. now, right? I mean, in 2004, when I was a new agent, you go into a home and you'd execute a search warrant. You know, as the Constitution prescribes, there's an attachment in the search warrant that gives a particular description of the items to be seized. And so, you know, it's, hey, we're, you know, in a white collar case, you might be looking for, you know, ledgers and, you know, cash and checkbooks and, you know, things like that. And there might be a computer there where you go, hey, maybe there's some records on it so we'd seize the computer as well. It's not uncommon to go into a house today or a business, for example, and seize 100, 100 different devices, right? I mean, your dishwasher has a computer. I mean, everything <laughs> has... Uh, you know, a memory card, the ability to store data, and so the places that we have to look to find where the information is, is just exponentially larger than what it was, you know, when I came in. Mm -hmm. The international aspect, you know, is certainly there. And then I guess I would say going back to, you know, kind of the changing nature on the national security threats, it's really, you know, in 2004, just a few years after 9-11, you know, we... I say this again, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, we quote-unquote knew what a terrorist looked like, right? They belonged to a particular foreign terrorist organization that was located in a particular region of the world, like that's who we were going after. The challenge today is, yeah, we're still concerned about that, don't get me wrong, we still have, you know, significant concerns, especially if you look at what's going on in Afghanistan and other potential strongholds of foreign terrorist organizations that could reconstitute themselves and they still have ambitions to attack the United States. But now in addition to that, you have an increasingly self-radicalizing population of individuals yeah. as opposed to groups that are infinitely more difficult to detect. If you're following an organization, you track the money, you track you know, the weapons, you track the communications. How do you track somebody who's 19 or 20 years old who has zero criminal history or very minimal criminal history who anonymously is self-radicalizing in their home and planning something that nobody else is tracking on. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps us up at night, is that proliferated you know, all over the place is, is really the challenge of law enforcement today. Right, and you spoke to you know, the importance of people saying something when they see something, you know, parents who are, who are out there monitoring their, you know, their children. Yeah. And, th and the other thing that I wanted to say too, Shakila, to answer the second part of your question, you know, wh how can the FBI continue to adapt? I think it's one of the hallmarks of a healthy organization that, that we do continue to adapt. The FBI, you know, despite what you may see or hear or think about you know, and, and read in some outlets, we're actually very good at doing lots of introspection and soul searching of where we are and where we need to go. I mean, this is an organization that 60 years ago was tapping Martin Luther King's phones, mm -hmm. right? It, like something that we would, you could never imagine today. And so the organization took a really hard look and now there's very specific rules and things put in place to make sure that those abuses of the past don't exist. We're an organization that you know, used to investigate draft dodgers. And I mean, the, the threats and challenges that we faced every decade, we continue to adapt. One, because there's new crimes that we couldn't have never envisioned that we now need to investigate. And two, as state and local and tribal and other law enforcement agencies become, you know, kind of, um, as we partner with them more, the FBI focuses more on the crimes that we are uniquely positioned to investigate. Like, you know, 30 years ago, every FBI office was rolling out on every bank robbery, right? We have a very capable police department here. And so we have task force officers that will still investigate, you know, bank robberies, you know, from time to time, but that's not our bread and butter like it used to be. The FBI is focusing on issues where there's kind of sole jurisdiction, counterintelligence, you know, hate crimes, public corruption, things where other departments can't investigate. And everything that we do, I guess I would say the other change has been, is done in partnership, right? And so this is a, law enforcement is the ultimate team sport and everything that we do is done in partnership with Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, Henderson Police Department, you know, other um, task force uh, officers that we have from other departments. So that we're kind of, you know, bringing forces together. Long gone are the days of, you know, like you see in the movies, right, where the FBI were taking over. They actually show those sort of clips of examples of what not to do. Because we just can't afford to, like, work these things in a vacuum. And so I anticipate that you'll see increasing um, progress towards bringing in additional stakeholders. Our counterintelligence program, for example, is one... Those guys used to work that kind of you know, stuff. Even in FBI offices, other agents wouldn't know they, what they were doing. Now we have a task force that includes 
17, 18 different agencies that are all working together with the FBI to address these threats. The sharing that we do with the public sector or the uh, community outreach or the private sector or higher education, that would have never happened under J. Edgar Hoover, but it's absolutely the lifeblood of making sure that we're staying ahead of the threats in 2022 and as we move beyond. SAC Evans, thank you. I want to get you out here on time, and I also want to save some time for, for any questions. So um, we'll, we'll have a mic that will we'll come in, along in, in just a minute, but first a, a question online um, from one of our online viewers said, what, what impact would securing the border have on fentanyl deaths? Yeah, so this is a very complicated question, right? Yeah. And the reason it's complicated is it hinges on what the definition of securing the border uh, means. And so the, the FBI director recently got this question when he was testifying before for one of the House uh, oversight committees. And so I think I'll probably have safe ground if I mimic what his uh, uh, response was, since he knows this issue probably better than anybody. The challenge is that, yeah, there's lots of drugs that are pouring, you know, across, you know, the open parts of the border, right, from, from what I understand, but also a significant percentage of it comes in through the ports of entry. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, this is like whack-a-mole, right? And so I think the FBI would say from our standpoint, yeah, look, we're, we're always, you know, going to be a proponent of the better that we can do to stop something before it gets into the country, the easier it's going to be and the less there is to, you know, to deal with. But it's also such a multifaceted, you know, problem that there's no kind of one silver bullet solution of, oh, if we just lock down this. I mean, one thing I learned in my three and a half years in San Diego is the ingenuity of transnational criminal enterprises of being able to get stuff into the country through a variety of ways. There is kind of, you know, no one way of stopping it. Mm, thank you. Does anyone else in the room have a, a question? And we'll just bring this mic over. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, appreciate what you do for us. Thank you. Um, I'm from North Carolina. Uh, just in the past year, and it kind of goes back to the, unfortunately, the uh, question online kind of took part of it away. But um, we're already in the past year just because of the flow of what's going on at the border and um, how our current administration is really not addressing it. Um, I'd like to know how involved organizations are together, like the Border Patrol, FBI, uh, and field offices down there or around the country. How much are they involved in whether it's, you know, sex trafficking, human trafficking, the fentanyl? How much are, are y'all working together to yeah. Do something about this. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So I, you know, I'll, I'll be careful to not speak for our border offices like San Diego and Phoenix, um, you know, especially what they're doing now. But my experience has been, kind of goes back to what I was talking about, all the different, you know, the FBI has investigative purview over so many different things. We really try to focus on where do we add the most value to these sort of investigations. So Department of Homeland Security, huge, you know, organization, right, that has, you know, ICE and Homeland Security investigations and the Border Patrol, I mean, that, that is their bread and butter, that's their primary purview. But in as much as what is coming across the border, you know, affects our investigative interests, yeah, we participate in task force offices, uh, uh, we have um, border liaison officers who are agents assigned to coordinate directly with those countries. We have folks embedded in those countries. And a lot of what the FBI, you know, does is intelligence sharing to try to identify areas of, you know, common concern. So yeah, we don't have agents, you know, we're not out on horseback at the, you know, at the border, um, but we're trying to identify, you know, how, where, where is it coming from and where do we get the most bang for our buck as we work together? So what I would say is the organizations, you know, the, these, these agencies actually work really well together. Um, I say there's lots of information sharing. When I was at, first time I went to headquarters, I was in a joint multi-agency intelligence center that specifically served that purpose to bring everybody's information together from the Border Patrol and from, you know, DHS and DEA and FBI and try to find those common connections where we could do good. But yeah, I mean, to your point, it, it's a challenge because the volume is, you know, is oppressive in some cases. And so you're, you know, you're trying to figure out where you get, again, the most bang for your buck of getting it before it comes to the U.S. And, you know, that, that's a challenging ecosystem in a variety of ways. Another question here. Uh, well, the, uh, the, this past week, uh, there was an incident in North Carolina where two uh, electrical power stations were uh, were taken out by uh, gunfire. Yeah. 
Now, that's not the first time that something like that happened. Uh, yeah, back in 2013, in April of 2013 in San Jose, uh, there were a couple of uh, related incidents uh, uh, in the uh, middle of April of 2013. The first thing that happened in early morning was uh, some persons or persons took out uh, fiber optic cables from two different companies, and then shortly after that, uh, there was a major uh, power substation in uh, South San Jose that was shot up. Yep. And you know, I'm, I was interested in that because I was living in the area and the company that I was working for at the time was impacted by the, uh, the loss of uh, communication because of those fiber optic cables. And, you know, the uh, local news media reported about that at the time, but most of the rest of the country did not find out about it until about a year later uh, when Wall Street Journal published a uh, front page article. Now, uh, I've read a little bit about uh, the, uh, the incident in the last uh, you know, number of years, but as far as I know, you know the persons or persons who uh, were responsible have never been caught. So, uh, can you shed any light on, uh, on that? So I'm poorly positioned to speak about, you know, cases in North Carolina. I'm far more comfortable and, and uh, apt to be able to speak about what's going on in Nevada. But the, the issue that you're bringing up is targeting of cri critical infrastructure, which is of interest to the FBI for sure. Um, and this is one of those game changers that I, that I think I was alluding to earlier. The FBI's extensive outreach and engagement with the private sector because it's something like 72% of the critical infrastructure in the United States is owned and operated by the private sector. And so there's you know, significant risk of you know, individuals or groups targeting that critical infrastructure and doing significant damage. And so, again, can't speak to that specific, but I do know the FBI is absolutely going to be involved in those sort of cases, uh, trying to help you know, as part of the investigative team when those sort of things are happening. And that can happen in the cyber realm and the physical realm, kind of you know, all of the above. Thank you. Any other questions? Right here. Hi, um, I live in Fallbrook. You're probably familiar with Fallbrook. Sure. And uh, I'm an avocado farmer. And I've heard that um, there are, the cartels have taken over the avocado ranches in Mexico, and yet the U.S. imports hundreds of millions of dollars worth of avocados. Hmm. Is that anything that the FBI would be in, get into or? Um, okay, so I guess it's it tough to answer kind of in the abstract and not knowing the specifics of that particular one. What I would say is the FBI is absolutely constantly assessing what intelligence and information we have about drug cartels, how they're operating, um, you know, what, who they're connected to, what's the, what the routes of supply are, what their chain of command looks like, what you know, kind of ancillary businesses they're involved in. So again, hard to speak to the specifics of that one, but yeah, that's something that the FBI and law enforcement partners would be you know, assessing on a regular basis, definitely. Right over here. Good evening. Uh, I have a question. As you were um, stating multiple times tonight, the FBI and other federal agencies are facing more complex issues across the United States and across the world. Uh, to help handle that, how are you guys recruiting more talent? What does that look like? And if someone was interested in trying to join, what kind of qualifications is the FBI or other federal agencies looking for? Yeah, excellent question. So um, FBIjobs.gov, FBIjobs.gov is the FBI's website for um, all applicants interested in a career with the FBI. Has all kinds of information, breaks down every uh, different type of, of job by, by series. So roughly speaking, the FBI, we have three different types of careers. We have special agents, those that carry badges and guns and have arrest powers, right? Those, those that are like me. We have intelligence analysts, and then we have this huge broad category that's a catch-all called professional staff. And that's everything from auto mechanics to scientists to computer, you know, uh, forensics people, you know, everything in between. Um, one thing that I think is interesting that really speaks to kind of how strong the FBI brand is, at a time when law enforcement writ large is having a hard time recruiting folks, the FBI has had banner years for recruitment. We have record numbers of applicants that are seeking careers in the FBI in one of those three kind of broad categories or fields. Um, the requirements vary, as you can imagine, greatly. So I can speak, you know, most clearly to the special agent side. You have to be a minimum of 23 years old, a U.S. citizen, have a college degree, be able to hold the top secret security clearance, 
pass a bunch of you know, different tests and there's a whole process. We look for people that have a variety of different skills. One of the big pushes for the FBI is hiring for diversity. Diversity of experience, diversity of where you're from, languages you speak, things that you can do because we really want the FBI to reflect what American society looks like. That helps us better relate to, communicate with other people and have a variety of perspectives. So while we take people that have degrees in kind of lots of different things, there's a special emphasis these days on people that have computer science or hard science degrees, data science, all those sort of skill sets that are in demand with Silicon Valley. Guess what? We need the exact same folks to be doing that kind of work uh, within the FBI. It's a great organization um, to work for. Um, it's not a job for everybody. I'd be the first one to say that, but it's, it's an absolute uh, you know, privilege and pleasure to work for the FBI. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we are all set. Thank you for tonight's presentation. I know that you have been um, extremely involved in community outreach since your onboarding, and so we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to join us. So to everyone, have a great night. Thanks, Thank Jay. you.